Welcome to another episode out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Mr. David Cummins. How are you doing? David, tell me a little bit about yourself and if you want what you do professionally. Well, professionally, I am a high school history teacher. But the reason why I'm on here today is because I run a website and I have a podcast on Irish military history. And do you teach this history to those kids that you're teaching at school? It's not always on the curriculum, but it's a passion project of mine, so I got to do it, you know. So, uh, you know, uh, if I'm meant to be, you know, talking about, let's say, World War One, which is on the curriculum, or sorry, World War Two, which is on the curriculum, it's meant to maybe only take a couple of classes. I'll probably stretch that out and go full hog on it, you know, and it's a lot of fun for me, you know, so it makes uh, teaching a lot more interesting and they like, like it too, so. It's and funny, I, when you say Irish history, I only remember, um, I used to do a spinoff of this podcast called Fill in the Blank, where we focused on specific topics and I looked up war heroes that weren't really, you know, it seems like a lot through history, there are these unsung heroes that don't get a mention or they're not put into the main textbook or the articles, like some, there's a, such a, things such as the night witches i don't know if you knew too much about those but these were these russian women's that were fighting the nazi um, yeah, um yeah. army yeah using crop dusting airplanes well the one yeah. person that did stand out in my mind i think his name was jack churchfield and he was known as this the um the sword wheeling bagpipe playing badass or a nazi killing badass and what he would do is there's photos of him with a giant iron great sword like one of those freaking mm. scottish mm. type swords and yeah going into battle with that and then also he had an account and i don't i don't want to go too long with the explanation of it but he was playing bagpipes and his team had just got hit by a group of mortars so he was like one of the last survivors left and as he's dazed and confused he starts playing this song take me home or something on his bagpipes which was a family thing until the nazis came and grabbed him and then obviously took him um as a prisoner of war mm. Yeah, yeah, uh, Churchill was his name, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think he was with, um, I don't know whether it was the commandos or a Scottish regiment, but yeah, certainly, uh, I remember, yeah, there's pictures of him, there's a famous picture of him jumping off the boats on D-Day with his uh, brandishing his sword. Hey. Me, personally, I'd probably prefer a rifle. I was say, look, you got that that has happened in history, photograph, proof, all that. How is that not in the textbook? Why did I have to Google that on my own and then have to find multiple articles that talked about this one guy? Like, that dude should be given 30,000 medals of honor, and then everyone should just have a sword in training just for moments like that. Maybe. Well, I mean, when you think about the, the sheer size of all those kind of stories, you know, uh, you wouldn't be able to fit it all into a book, you know, especially not in, a, uh, especially not in the high school curriculum anyway like you know but even even just in history in general there's so many of those stories when you think about the sheer scale of uh, most conflicts and the sheer number of people that are involved in it you know it's just to pick out you know little bits and pieces and, and individual stories yeah that's great but you know, I'd rather learn about that than how a bill becomes a bill because that song has been stuck in my head since I was a child I'm just the bill on top of Capitol Hill it's this right. freaking cartoon I wanted to I will burn that VHS tape if I find it Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, I think I've seen that in The Simpsons. You know, we don't, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that over here, you know. When you do your podcast, like, what do you typically try and focus on, um, such as, like, what's something really interesting that you've learned or uh, you would like people to know a little bit more about that might not be keen on? Oh, I mean, so in Irish history, um, basically, the most talked about part of Irish history is known as the revolutionary period from about 1913 to about 1923 and in that we kind of have the formation of um, two rival sides and um, you basically have the nationalists who are looking for freedom from England you have unionists uh, who are hoping to stay part of Britain um, then World War One happens hundreds of thousands of Irishmen um, go off and fight for that then you have the 1960 rising which is kind of this ill thought out or rather it's more of a theatrical display it's kind of like a suicide mission really when uh, militarily anyway um but these guys try to over they take over dublin for about a week just less than a week and um, they try and have this massive big uprising uh, to get ireland's freedom from britain then following that um most of the ex most of the leaders are executed over that then you have the conscription crisis and then you'll have the w irish war of independence um, which eventually results in a partial independence from Ireland, apart from, so there's 
32 counties in Ireland and six of them remain in Ulster. Um, six of those remain part of the United Kingdom. And then Ireland breaks into a civil war from 1922 to 1923 over that. That, and then once that war ends, that kind of is the formation of the Irish Free State. And, you know, and, and that's pretty much, as people like to see, as the, uh, the most important part of Irish history. Now that there is a very, very condensed part. There are libraries of books written about all that kind of stuff. So that stuff is really interesting and a lot of people love that kind of stuff. I also like to talk about the other thousand of years you know, of history beforehand. So whether it's the Normans or if it's the Vikings uh, come to Ireland, invading, if it's um, you know, the plantations or any other famous battles like the Battle of uh, Kinsale or Scarif Hollis or, or the Battle of the Boyne or any of these really crucial moments in Irish history that are just not really well talked about. Do you, find that, kind of, do you find that a lot of people kind of are interested more on the war side of things? I know that sounds a little bit petty. Like if you ask somebody, um, you know, why do you like NASCAR? Well, you're really only watching it to see a crash happen, even though you don't want anybody to get hurt. You, it's, you still feel like crap for saying something like that. It's not just 300 laps of going around in the same circle. You're waiting just for something to mess up. But like with war, it seems like it's, nice to learn about um mostly to see like the types of battles and the significant details that are kind of spoken on like i know there was um there was a battle that was fought over a dog at one point and i think i forgot where that was exactly placed at but it was over a person's dog making a lot of noise an ambassador and some dude just got into a huge argument next thing you know there was just a battle and you start hearing stuff over these accounts what people will do to resort result to war i mean it feels like as a nation especially like in america we're on threat of war every single day whether we're dealing with north korea whether we're dealing with something um it it's I, like I said, it's a tough subject to talk about, but do you find that people are, are very interested in this overall, or do you find that they have maybe a, a significant other thing they like to go towards, like um, a certain character, like you ever talk about maybe a, a unsung hero? I find it's quite the opposite over here, really. Um, there's not a huge interest in Irish military history because it's kind of forgotten, and Ireland kind of has this um, notion that it's a neutral country let's say without a military past which is wrong um but insofar as picking an individual that's an unsung hero i find that quite a lot of people especially irish people would go uh, and gravitate towards someone who's really famous like michael collins i don't know if you've ever seen the film with liam neeson in it but michael collins is kind of like the the che Guevara of ireland basically he's the guy who is you know, you could argue, well, not argue, well, he's not solely responsible, but he's basically, in Irish understanding of it, the public understanding of it, um, he is kind of the guy who gets all the laudits and is responsible for getting Ireland its freedom um, from Britain during the, the War of Independence, which is, he does a lot, but he, it's, it's not purely on his shoulders. Well, you know, when we so, talk about maybe something you reflect into your podcast, what could you teach me if I have never, ever decided to listen to Irish history or anything? What can you inform me that will want to get me hooked to listen to your podcast? Because I'm a history guy. I mean, I'm a history buff. I like learning about, you know, things from other countries, especially because you end up finding out that somebody that's done something 100 years ago somewhere else, you're doing it right now in your country. And it's like, whoa, whoa, we're just making that person's mistakes at times. Yeah, I mean, so... What I find about the way I find or, or the way I teach history is you got to make it relatable, you know. So if I was to tell you, like, I used to live in London, uh, I used to live in Greenwich and up the road there was a, uh, a museum of fans, you know, those things that just ran out and you fan yourself. I couldn't care less about that, you know, I couldn't care less. But um, so I, you got to make it relatable. So um, American Civil War, OK, at least. 200,000 Irish born men serve in the American Civil War. Okay. If you can stretch that out to Irish Americans, it's at least 250,000. If you mentioned the, the Medal of Honor earlier on, half of the Medal of Honor uh, recipients, over half of the, uh, the Medal of Honor recipients are Irish Americans. And Irish born recipients of the Medal of Honor are the largest contingent of foreign born fighters um, who have ever received it. If you look at the Battle of Mobile Bay, um, 
the Battle of Mobile Bay during the American Civil War is a naval battle. I think it's something like 14 Irish-born men get the Medal of Honor, you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, like, you, 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 there's a whole heap of different stories. There's another guy, um, he is in the Navy. He's a young guy. Uh, I think he's ranked boy. I think he's like 14 or something like that. He's a teenager. And basically, he's on one of these ships, and basically, a shell blast comes in, blows open, uh, and basically, he loses both his arms, okay? Uh, and basically, he gets the Medal of Honor for still continuing on doing his job and all that kind of stuff during the battle, but he ends up having a terrible rest of his life, you know, because A, he's not from a class where, you know, they can afford themselves. People forget that, like, you know, once you're injured on the battlefield back then, you kind of can't no, do shit with your feet. Like I don't understand. Like I, I get, I get it now. Like, but still, receiving a medal of honor and dealing with that, like that is a very, very like I have never heard anybody losing both their arms like that. I'm, I'm definitely sure of it's happened. But holy oh, yeah. crap! Like yeah. you got to think. Like why isn't that? Like that for me, I'm already hooked. I'm already going to start listening to that because that. Yeah, sounds- you listen to uh, Damien Shields about that. Uh, that podcast with Damien, Doctor Damien Shields. He is deadly he, like that 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 podcast uh, was incredible the amount of stuff that i learned from that is yeah and i, I like i end up going out uh bought his book like and just reading it it's fun, fascinating there's so many stories like that um but yeah that that guy who loses both his arms he ends up like becomes an alcoholic uh he 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 loses a lot of his his uh his pension uh gambling you know and, and guys have to hold his cards for him you know, and obviously they're cheating him and they take the money out of his pocket and he can't really do anything about it. He becomes an alcoholic, abuses his wife, you know, and basically just has a terrible life, you know, afterwards. So, I mean, those are just some... How do you abuse your wife? That was my question. I was like, no, I guess he's kicking her and headbutting her. You know? <laughs> headbutting well, her, like, I guess. <laughs> you know, not, not to joke about it, but like, yeah, it's like... Yes, was, listeners, we're sorry. Domestic abuse is not funny. That just, that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's well, just picture some dude with no arms and just shut the yeah. door and let him sleep outside. It's weird. But, uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So like, so that's basically some of the stuff, um, that, you know, you might be f- interested in, um, you know, the, the, uh, local stuff. You, you're from Maryland and obviously that has a big part to play during the American civil war as well. You know, so there's just some of the stuff. Um, I mean, it's interesting because you look at like the types of, um, I guess, where people's heritage comes from. Um, shout out to Irish Mike. Uh, he makes his own jerky and everything. But there's also a thing like I'm part Irish, too. Uh, okay. You know, when we start looking deep in a small amount from my dad's side, basically everyone on my dad's side, they're all Irish or British or something. It comes from those lines. But it's also a sense of what that those people stand for as well. Uh, the Irish, like I knew about before when um, I had Mike on here and he was telling me about his symbol for his uh, company was his family crest. I knew that before he mentioned it because I know how much an honor in a family that heritage that there is between with the Irish. It's all about family. You guys have 10, 11, sometimes siblings at once. Um, you, you guys really care about family and you guys have the fighting spirit. And I think that's why when you talk about the Medal of Honor and all these people receiving it that are Irish or something, that is because of the fact that you have the fighting spirit, the ones that are going to protect your home and care for your loved ones. And I think that's important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly I can, I can vouch for that. I'm one of eight kids. Um, you know, so yeah, I've got a big family. We don't really have those big kids anymore. Those big giant families, you know, my brother, he's got one, two kids, same with my sister, you know, so that whole notion of us having giant families, that's kind of going by the wayside now. But, uh, but yeah, certainly that, that, that whole, um, that story of, yeah, being, uh, you know, giant families, Catholic for the most part, but yeah, we're definitely still very family orientated. You know, even, um, you know, I don't know if you know what WhatsApp is. It's basically like a free text service. Yeah, I, I yeah. Keep, in, keep in contact with some uh, Romanian and a Bulgarian kids I used to work with. Through yeah, that. yeah. I don't know why, but like, yeah, WhatsApp uh, is just doesn't take off, hasn't taken off in, in the States. But anyway, but, uh, but yeah, so like me and my family would have that um, and we'd have like a, a big group that we would chat to every day. And then probably on the weekends, we'd all end up having a big uh, house party, kind of one of those jobs. So yeah, we like to keep in contact and just, you know, chat away and have the crack. What have yeah. you found out through doing your podcast that is more of on the lines of like maybe something you didn't want to know or something that was really, really horrible that you kind of wish you didn't know? Like, I mean, I've researched into a lot about um, 
for instance, like I, all, all my information comes from America just because I feel like for in a place I live, I would like to know the history of this place as well. Also, I've done some countries, found come across some articles, but like I found out about this um, this state school where they were injecting mentally challenged people with um, hepatitis C and all these other types of crazy disastrous thing. There's photos of stuff that comes with MK Ultra. I had to want to. I wanted to know more about who are who's these people called the government. Have you ever found out some of this stuff? Because like for me, when I came across it, I was heartbroken, man. Like you start hearing about kids that are getting thrown into a room six of them at a time with shit all over the floor walls and they're forced to shower with each other and nobody's giving them the light of day it just shows like what we would do to our own people at times as well yeah i mean i I wouldn't come across this in my podcast because it's not military history orientated but certainly we would have um episodes like that in irish history um certainly during the 20th century we would have had the magdalene laundries where young girls and women who have had children out of wedlock were basically scooped up and sent off and never heard of ever again and basically they would have just been free labor to various industries in in the town Um, and it was basically modern day slavery essentially Uh, they weren't allowed to get escape you know Um, yeah it was just terrible terrible stuff you know Um, run by religious orders uh, and so that kicks up a big hornet's nest still to this day Um, I mean the last one I think they were mostly gone by the, I think it was the 19, I wouldn't be sure, but basically the last one I think closed in the 1990s, which is unheard of. Um, but yeah, so so we get like huge, huge, uh, there's discussing aspects of uh, Irish history like that. I mean, if, if you want to pick it, one individual person, uh, I was talking to uh, Professor Jim, uh, Dr. Jim O'Neill about the Nine Years' War, a very important and well-known part of Irish history. And there's this one particular lady, uh, Grace O'Malley, and she's this famous Irish pirate queen. And eventually at one part, part of the war, she ends up siding with Queen Elizabeth. And for me, I was like, what? Couldn't believe it. Because she is kind of hailed as this big hero, you know, and this, you know, this fierce Irish lady. And, and then she's siding with Queen Elizabeth, the enemy. And you're just like, oh. Now, in fairness, you know, it's purely because, well, because she wanted to be on the winning side, you know. That's why. And if she didn't, she'd lose everything. And it wasn't really her, it was her sons. So, you know, but yeah, you get, you get huge. Yeah, there's, there's so many different parts of, uh, of Irish history like that. Um, you know, even just there, the other day I was talking with um, another professor and she was basically saying, you know, there's, um, during the War of Independence, when Ireland was fighting for its independence, the enemy police force notoriously known as the black and tans these guys would show up uh, because their uniforms were black and tan and but basically these guys the black and tans would show up and they would you know burn people out of their house and home uh, set fire to people kill people in the middle of the night and what they would do to women was to shave their head you know kind of as a as a mark you know saying like nobody's safe from us we're going to be just absolutely you know brutal um but i was talking with this professor, Dr. Mary McAuliffe, the other day, and she um, she was basically like, yeah, no, the IRA did that too. Anybody that they thought was out walking around or, you know, kind of courting or dating a British soldier or member of the Crown Authorities, you know, they quite often, well, not quite often, quite often, but they sometimes got their head shaven too. So I was like, well, okay, we we're both bastards, really. It's crazy because if you look at like uh, Germany, what they would also do, um, like with Ireland, if maybe shaving your head, Germany, they would just tar and feather you. They would have you run through the streets as a sign of, you know, betrayal or a sign of like, um, may really taking away someone's confidence and self-worth. I mean, throughout history, there's been crazy accounts of what each nation has done something and each nation has things to appraise about it too. I mean, we, as people, you know, history is obviously written by the winner. But when you start looking up your own articles and try to find out your own information about at least a place that you're interested about, such as Ireland, you're going to find out a lot about heritage. You're going to find out a lot about war. Have you ever thought about maybe talking to some of these people that are involved in the military, maybe a little bit older or retired? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the combatants from the War of Independence or the Irish Civil War would certainly all have been, uh, would all be dead by now. You know, you're talking nearly 100 years ago. So they'd all be long in the grave. Um, but yeah, no, no, I do talk, uh, I do have a number of people lined up to talk about, you know, the more famous aspects of um, 
of Irish military history. Actually, just before you got online, um, I was checking through my spam and I got into contact with um, an ex-army officer, uh, Sean A. Murphy, and we're going to start talking about Kilmichael. And Kilmichael is a really famous ambush during the War of Independence where uh, Tom Barry and, the, and his men, his flying column, uh, basically ambush these auxiliaries, the enemy police force, and end up killing, I think, 17 out of 18, 17 out of, 18 of them. Uh, the 18th, he basically was left with uh, severe damage um, and was basically uh, um, brain dead for the rest of his life, you know, so he couldn't, uh, um, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't survive himself. Uh, and then, um, but basically there's, there's a whole kind of ferrari about the, uh, this ambush, whether, whether they shot these guys uh, as prisoners, you know, um, because of the forensics uh, on their body, on the, the corpses, you know, they had uh, bullet holes through their hands and through their armpits, which suggests that they had their hands up when they were shot, you know, um, which is, so yeah, I'm, I'm talking to that guy. Uh, I got to go and write up a list of questions and, and, and chat to that guy. So yeah, pretty interesting about that. Um, but like I said, I can't talk to anybody who has firsthand accounts with that. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's, you know, that's just museum work. And thankfully the uh, Irish um, defense archive basically the irish defense forces archive that's mostly digitized right now so i can go on and just have a you know look through a heap of stuff just there last night i was looking at the kilmina ambush which is an ambush for the ira that goes terribly wrong for them and so i was looking at you know the, the primary artifacts uh primary sources rather of all that kind of stuff so it's pretty cool it's um interesting because what i meant like when you're finding like if you could talk to even a descendant or someone that's maybe you know had yeah. family involved in it or someone that has joined it into the military is involved with it and you could just talk about the changes from back then to how it is now has you guys included or changed anything have you guys you know done it a different way have you guys done anything significant to upgrade the military at all as well and i think learning about that stuff like i remember i went to go see the pearl harbor museum in hawaii um, you have to take a boat out onto the water and you get to see the sunken ships underwater. Mm -hmm. And there was a Pearl Harbor survivor there. It was an old man in a wheelchair, barely could hear. And they were talking to him and his family because what they would do is if they get your ashes um, when you're cremated at when you die, they will take it and they'll go underwater and put it inside of the boat so you can be with the rest of your comrades. And I thought that was the most fucking interesting thing in the world because listening to this guy talk about like that, even remembering like just blinking and talking about sometimes seeing it, you know, you know, the bombs coming in and all the explosions happening and just hearing people screams and seeing him tear up over there. I mean, that brought a tear to your eye. I think these are important moments that a lot of people, and especially nowadays with the fact like Fortnite became so fucking popular, you're never going to know about this type of stuff if there isn't for teachers. And now we're looking at situations where kids aren't able to go to school. Like I'm really afraid of what's going to happen in the next couple of years with just people missing out on all this good education, dude, because like, I remember sitting in class in seventh grade and they would, it was Pearl Harbor day. They played that fucking movie and it, you are hooked, man. There was nobody on their cell phone. There was no one on their iPod touches, whatever. When that shit came out, the green day could wait, whatever. And we're all sitting there watching Pearl Harbor movies, man. It's just like, Holy crap. Like this is a long movie, but you're so like the gravity in it, man. It really brought to real like features to you that like, wow, this was something that our nation went through. It was a terrible fucking time. And it's a time it, it makes you feel closer to the people that are around you. And I think every nation has a story like that. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah. I mean, like, like I said, that's one of the things that um, you need to do, especially when you're talking about history, you got to make it relatable uh, and you know, you got to be able to tell a story. And so stuff like that, uh, I've used that that scene in Pearl Harbor, you know, a lot when we're talking about the uh, Second World War. And um, the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan is also another, you know, great one uh, that really kind of just brings it home for them. Um, there's another German TV uh, series, which name escapes me now, and that kind of shows the fighting on the Eastern Front. You know, so there's multiple different ways that you know you can show that. Um, but yeah, certainly having somebody uh, first-hand accounts are what are really important. Um, there is a famous battle in the Congo um, during the 1960s, the Battle of, uh, the battle of Jadoville, or Jadotville, uh, as the locals would pronounce it. But basically, um, it's Irish UN peacekeepers, and they get surrounded by like 3,000 Katanganese and Belgian, um, Belgian mercenaries. And there's like 156 of these Irish guys, you know, lightly armored, and basically they end up 
the Irish guys hold out for a week until they literally run out of water and bullets, you know, and, and inflict hundreds and hundreds of casualties on the enemy force until they're eventually, they have to surrender because they, you know, they haven't got enough water and stuff like that. But where I live uh, in Ireland, there's one of those guys who was there and I'm mad to find out, kind of have a chat with him and get based like his first hand account well like that there's most people uh, most of those guys are you know dead and gone now so it's hard to get their story although netflix has made a movie out of it as well uh, so at least in that way it's kind of kept on how do you typically um um like when you come in the podcast do you ever find a, come across one that's a little bit similar to yourself like just talking about the history of maybe some things i feel like um just with the amount of podcasts that are out there even though yours is very niche i mean fucking I, when I saw Irish history, I was like, that's a new one I have not really heard of before. And I feel like you have to do something to at least make it a little bit different than um, the others, just so you can stick out and attract a different view of audiences. Yeah, I mean, so this goes back to that idea of what I said earlier on, that the idea that Ireland has, you know, no military history or, you know, that we're a neutral country. And it's, you know, that's, that's the reason why I... I that's what annoyed me. So my master's, I have a master's degree in military history and strategic studies. And basically, um, I'm interested in all that kind of stuff. Um, but that market is dominated by, you know, American military history, British, mil Amer um, British military history, and probably like German or Russian. You know, those would be the big ones. And then everybody else, you know, oh, you know, they did a little bit of this and they did a little of that, a bit of that. And I was like, well, that's not really true because, you know, I knew about the the you know, 250,000, uh, quarter of a million Irishmen who served in the American Civil War. I knew about the 200,000 that served in the First World War. I knew about the 50,000 that served in the Second World War. You know, most of the British, or a lot of the British general command were of Irish descent or Irish born, you know. Dale, uh, he was born in Northern Ireland. Uh, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, he was raised in Donegal and, uh, in Ulster, you know, for part of his childhood. Uh, you know, there's a whole heap of them. Um, so I was like, why isn't anybody talking about this? And it was kind of almost out of, not frustration, but it was just like, here, listen, we have a story to tell. No one else is telling it. I won't tell this story because, you know, there's so much there. Like I said, there's a, you know, over a thousand years of Irish military history to talk about. Whether you're talking about the Battle of Clontarf. Um, What's the Battle know. of Clontarf? So basically the Battle of Clontarf is um, the High King of Ireland, Brian Baru, and his men of, um, there's four provinces in Ireland. There's Ulster in the north, Leinster in the east, Munster in the south, and Connacht in the west. And basically, the High King of Ireland, he's from down the uh, south, a place called Munster. He is fighting against the men of Leinster. And in the misconception of it is that it's Brian Brew, the High King, and he's fighting against the Vikings, and we win, and you know, well, hey, Ireland is freed from Viking rule, which just isn't the case at all. Both sides have Vikings in there as well. Um, I've read Viking literature, um, Njal's saga, I think it was, it was a 13th century uh, saga, and that, you know, has an account of the, uh, the guys in it fighting in this Battle of Clontarf. But basically, the Battle of Clontarf is, it's kind of like a civil war battle between the guys of Munster versus the guys of Leinster. They fight against each other, um, and basically, that's all it is. But the, the, the High King of Ireland, Brian Baru, this other kind of famous person in Irish history, he gets killed when he's um, praying in his tent at the end of the battle because uh, it's Good Friday, which is a holy day. And so he gets killed by this uh, Viking called Bruder. Um, and it, during the battle, his son and grandson are also killed. So this kind of hereditary title, this lineage is kind of going by the wayside. And so it's kind of this, oh, what would have happened if, you know, the, uh, the Battle of Clontarf had been won and Brian Brew kind of lived, what would Ireland have been? It would have been so much better. But, now, you know. stick with me on this. I know this is going to sound a little bit stupid, but are you a fan of video games? Um, I don't play too many of them, to tell you the truth. There's a game coming out called Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw an ad for this on YouTube. That is going to be a big increase of people interested in this type of history. I've always been a fan of like ancient Greeks and Vikings and all these types of things. And I think 
Thor and Avengers maybe made a bit of an increase of it just on his own for people wanting to look up Odin and all these types of yeah, folklore about it. Stick a toe in the door, like, you know, kind of yeah. open the door, a little peek, you know. So, do you think this is, like, going to be a prime time when that game gets released? Do you think a lot of people that are playing it when they're – obviously, um, the coolest thing about Assassin's Creed is the fact that they do use – they do alter a little bit of the history and obviously add you into the mix of it, but they also teach you a good amount of it, too. I mean, it caused me to look up one of my – famous painters um leonardo da vinci you know the artist like the, his one of his my favorite quote of his is the fact that art is never finished just left undone and that meant always coming back to a piece to be able to add on to it or to fix it or be able to make an adjustment to it so all of his works he was i mean he was known as the best unfinished everything like he just never finished anything and I think uh, with Von Holla coming out, like it's going to make sense that a lot of people are going to see this. They're going to see the swinging swords, the axes, the awesome ass beards, the freaking, you know, the, the armor, the face paint, all the stuff. And that's going to cause them to look a little bit more into what this history or what this religion or what this even race of people were, you know, seeing all them learn a little bit more about their traditions, which is in turn going to be good news for you because you get to link right into Ireland with that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, like I was saying earlier on, you know, what makes history more interesting to people is when it's made relatable. And like I said, a lot of people are going to play this game and a lot of people do play computer games. Um, you know, look at Battlefield Five, uh, sorry, Battlefield One, which was about the First World War, you know, and there was never any war, uh, there was never any, you know, big hype about the First World War, the war to end all wars. And so that done huge amounts of, uh, uh, you know, great in, that opened the door to huge amounts of interest and um, a lot more people got invested in the first world war because of that one computer game whereas now with this assassin's creed uh, valhalla that's going to do the exact same thing you know especially because it's building on what Thor and the avengers movies has already done so yeah it's, it's going to be really interesting but yeah like that you do kind of certainly for myself you kind of want to ride the crest of a wave and see what's you know popular you know you don't want to be like oh everybody's looking over here well i'm going to talk about this thing that's super niche and boring and nobody's going to really care about you want to get in on that bandwagon as well and kind of uh, get your most out of it but yeah certainly the um, ireland has got a you know fairly rich um fairly rich history with the vikings i mean dublin uh, the capital city of ireland that's a viking town that's you know built on a uh, dove lane or um basically is the irish to the gaelic translation of dark pool dove and lynn which means dark pool and, and basically that was where the vikings had their original uh, fortification um you know and then like most of the other cities around ireland they're all on the coast and they all would have been um they all would have been viking settlements as well like limerick cork waterford wexford all these places so yeah definitely like um that's one thing that i really want to get into uh talking about is viking history it's just it, it can be a little bit hard to find out who's the best one to talk to you know you don't you, you see other bits and people uh, you see some people who might have an interest in it but you want to kind of talk certainly i do i want to talk i want to talk to the top dog who knows the most about it and it can be a little bit hard getting in to do that you know yeah it's definitely nice to have accounts to be able to get the information kind of a little bit something that's closer to the source than just reading it out of a book and trying to plot your information because you don't know who really kind of was what side they were favoring or whatever when they mm -hmm. wrote it how it's you know being dumbed down or watered down a little bit it's weird and it's a little bit more i guess would say it would soak a little bit more into your head when you hear accounts from an actual person like i used to volunteer um it wasn't on my own. It was for school. I had to do it. So nobody give me a pat on the back. Like I'm joining some SPCA or something. No, but I would help out at a retirement home and I would hear the accounts of people that were growing up in like the 1920s um, and talking about going through the war, a bunch of stuff. You've been listening to my grandfather's accounts to the point where you're like, I fucking heard it before. Now I just let him talk about it because it's so nice to hear him recount these memories. You know, he yeah. went to the war when he was 18 years old, had to come back when he was 20 because his dad died he had to raise the rest of his family he never got to pursue any of his dreams but he, reading that is completely different than if you're hearing that from the actual person and it puts a new gravity into a situation i mean when you're reading ac across these accounts based on to whether you're reading it from a book and then you're hearing it from the person you can tell the shift there you can tell that there's the information this person just gave to you this story this thing where you're so in tune you're like watching the avengers you're like oh, like what's going to happen next that information soaks in there more and like you said in the beginning teaching history the most important thing is being relatable 
people want to find something they can connect with. And when they're reading it from a textbook, it's very hard. But when someone says it in their voice and you hear that empathy, you hear that tone, that causes their ears to perk up. That causes their mind to go straight and focus onto those things. And I think that's what's very, very special about learning about our history. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you see it, well, I certainly see it a lot online where even just, just there today, um, this guy's grandparent uh, just passed away and he was raging, you know, but he had, he had said that he'd managed to spend a lot of time with her um, and record a lot of her conversations about, you know, Irish history and folklore and mythology and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, while he was upset that she had passed, it, her stories were still told. But I remember from my own personal uh, view, I remember my grandfather when he was on his deathbed and like I was, um, yeah, because I, I was super interested in, in the military back then as well. And I was only like 14, but I remember he, um, I, I literally found out on his deathbed that he had been in the, the, um, the army reserve during the Second World War. And I was, my mind was blown about this. I couldn't believe it because I'd basically just wasted all this time, um, you know, as a young lad. And I never got to hear him talk about that because that would have been something that would be fascinating. You know, I would have loved to have heard what he had to say about all that kind of stuff. I suppose that goes into the, you know, the whole psychology of humans and, you know, that we are a social creature and we like that human connection. And, you know, because it, like you said, if you're reading that off a book, if you're reading the most saddest thing, but you're reading it in a funny voice, well, if anybody's listened to it, it's probably just going to come across funny, you know? Yeah. Whereas if I'm sitting there and I'm telling you this heartbreaking story, you'll feel that emotion as well, because, you know, that, that's, that's the emotion that's, that's been brought across. But yeah, certainly, um, yeah, like getting first-hand accounts and, and people who are there, it's, it's absolutely vitally important. In Ireland, one of the things that they did in the 60s, I think it was, so I remember I told you about the, the War of Independence from 1919 to 1921. Basically, you know, 40 years later, they managed to talk or round up as many of the veterans as possible. And they basically just went through all of their experiences. And so all of this massive big trove of first-hand accounts of all these soldiers from the Irish War of Independence are all been digitized and put up online for anybody to read. So it's, it's, it's amazing to be able to, be, you know, even though they're gone, you can still access that kind of material. But yeah, I like that, you know, my mom doesn't like to talk about history and every once in a while she just drop this little tidbit and I'm like, whoa, hang on a second, like, <laughs> you know, like, rewind on that there, tell us more about this, like, yeah. you know, uh, her grandfather, so my great-grandfather uh, or great-great-grandfather, he would have been in the British Army during the Boer War. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's amazing, you know, and then, you know, uh, um, a couple of years back as well, I found out that my, my other great-grandfather, he was in the First World War during the Battle of Jutland, you know, the largest ne naval battle that had ever taken part up until that point. So, yeah, it was, it was really interesting. It's, um, hard, it's yeah. hard to see people open up about the, well, like the war they've been in. You know, I've heard accounts of people saying stuff like, um, I was like, do you ever think about any of the people you killed? No, we never think about the people we killed. We think about the people that we couldn't take back home. You know, yeah. you're not upset about killing the enemy. You're, you're thinking in the mindset of they're the enemy. They're going to encroach onto your territory, hurt your family. You're in protective mode. So you don't even think about those. You think about the people you've lost. And I, I'll never forget my buddy's dad when I was a little kid. Like, he had – basically, he'd walk around in his underwear. But he – like, like in the middle of the night or something, like to go get, go get some milk from the fridge or something. He'd just be in his underwear. And I remember I was eating breakfast one time. I was just looking at him. And his back was completely, like, new skin graft onto it. Like, looked like he was in a severe burn. And I knew he fought in the military and was still fighting. So I immediately – immediately my brain goes, Iraq or Afghanistan or something. Something that was common and happening at the time. And I kept asking my buddy. I was like, man, I don't want to mention it because of the war. My buddy just didn't even – I guess he wasn't paying attention to me. He just completely forgot about it, whatever. Next thing I know, I was like, I mean, this is 10 years later, man. I mean, I was 17, I think. So I was like seven when I first started realizing this stuff, maybe six. And I asked him, I was like, dude, I have to know, man, what are those on your, like, how did you get that? And he goes, oh, I was cooking with a fire when I was a kid and I fell and went, I was like, are you fucking kidding me? He's like, what? I'm like, I thought you were in the war and you got burned. And he goes, no, man, I was, I was a dumb kid and it slipped on a fire. Next thing you know, I burned my whole back up. They had to take it from my ass. And I'm like, 
You understand for the longest time I was afraid to mention that. You know how many times I've seen your shirt off, sir, and I've wanted to ask that? You give me a hug. I'm afraid to fucking hug you. He goes, yeah, I wonder why you hug me like a sissy. I was like, well, like I'm my, it's like when you find out like that person you call yeah, your yeah. uncle is not your uncle. Your mind's yeah. fucking blown. <laughs> Jesus. That's not all right. Ah, oh, dude. I mean, I was I was shocked for a good for a good few hours. After. I was eating spaghetti dinner that night, and I was just looking at him like, "You're a fucking phony." Like, I was, he's like, "Why are you mad at me?" I'm like, "I'm not mad at you. I get it. I'm glad you served our country and everything." Yeah. You're a phony for not being what I've created in my mind about you, I, dude. I had, it's like when you uh, trick yourself into believing you had a certain memory or something. Like, ah, I'm pretty sure I did that. I'm pretty sure that happened or something. Yeah. That's what I did. I was like, dude, I'm pretty, I, I know, like, I don't know. His dad was in the war, bro. His dad, that's how he got his burns. And people are just looking at me like, no. Did you ever ask him? You, you were saying your, uh, well, your grandfather was in the war? Yeah, my grandfather. He's in the army. I, I, I presume that's Second World War? Oh, my God. I hope I don't get this wrong. I think so. He's around 78 right now. Yeah, I know. He wouldn't be. That would be Vietnam War. Or maybe. Yeah, I yeah. think it was. I'm pretty sure it was Vietnam. Because B-Day, like, yeah, 75th anniversary. So, this is yeah. this is the worst part about me is I don't know when the wars took place. I'm just sitting there. I'm like, yeah, oh, it happened. I heard it. I heard it. I seen it. I seen it on the telly. I saw. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, that, that's that's funny. Um, my wife is American. Um, and so, you know, we went to watch, did you see that um, film who came out there last year, Dunkirk? Dunkirk. I saw it in theaters. I didn't actually get to see the movie. I knew, I knew it was there though. So basically Dunkirk is, you know, part of the second world war it takes place in 1940. Um, and so basically, you know, the British expeditionary forces sitting up in France uh, and basically May, 1940, the Germans just plow through um, the low countries, you know, um, Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg smash into France and basically push all of these guys back right up into the coast, the French coast, where they're at the, the port town of Dunkirk. And the British basically haul ass and try to get as many boats, you know, rowboats, sailboats, leisure boats, any ship, anything that floats, get it across the channel and pick up as many of these guys and get them back, you know. And they end up, I think, saving 330,000 sailors, uh, sorry, um, uh, soldiers, right? But it's in 1940. My wife, being American, is like, yeah, but the Second World War didn't start until 1941. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. That's when America joined, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that war was going on for another two years before you guys came in. That was in 1939 when that kicked off. It's crazy oh, to think of all that, too. Like, the fact that that small of a country was so powerful and almost took over the whole entire world. Like I always, they, they always talk about um, the weaponry, like when they would, like for us, when we'd kill a German soldier, uh, we would drop our weapons and pick up one of theirs because theirs was a lot better. It was more built to last. And like, you know, the only reason we really won, like for America is the fact is not only the amount of things that we had was like when they had one tank, we had five, you know, it mm -hmm. was always that McDonald's style type thing where we're cranking out these patties like crazy. You just can't keep up. You know what I mean? But this was yeah. something where a nation, all these nations got together and we're like we all need to realize that this fucking dude's nuts and he's going to end up taking over all of us if we don't take a stand and that's where everybody put their shit aside and literally formed up against one country yeah yeah yeah, for sure and uh certainly you know you, you can't uh you can't forget about the the, the russians as well you know by d-day when the Allies were landing on, on the beaches in Normandy, something like 75% of the German army was on the Eastern Front fighting the Russians, you know. So uh, really it was the Russians that, that did the, the donkey work, you know. That, that, that leads into one of my favorite programs I ended up finding out about called Operation Paperclip, where we split the Nazi scientists into yeah, three yeah, different yeah. groups and stuff. And it le leads to, like, we talk about finding out uh, war history or finding out something of extreme importance. Operation Cherry Blossoms at Night. Have you ever heard of it? No. So you always think of the Nazis when you think of like the worst, maybe terroristic group or something, you know, something that was like a weird experimental, whatever group that would experiment on people and do these weird freak experiments. Unit 731 was Japan's. Now oh, you yeah, talked, yeah. 
yeah, you, yeah. you talked before about uh, women that would disappear and stuff like this. Well, Japan has something similar, but they mm -hmm. called it the biomedical tissue services of Japan. They would roll around. There was 50 black vans that would roll around different towns and take like five or six people and bring them back to this camp where they would call them logs. So these logs that they would write into this book was a keyword for people. And then they would talk about the experiments they would put on them. Well, Operation Cherry Blossoms at Night. But there was a planned attack around the time Pearl Harbor happened um, that they were going to launch a sub with these missiles that carried about 250 million fleas like that were infected with the bubonic plague. And they were yeah. going to hit yeah. off the coast of San Francisco. You hear about that fucking shit? And then you're like, what happens like if we zigged instead of zagged? Like, what would happen if we didn't do that and that ended up coming true? You know how fucking hard it is to kill a flea? I can't yeah. kill one without waking up with like red bumps all over me like this motherfucker. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it, that's a pain in the ass to think that our whole country would have been shifted if a moment like that would have occurred. Like you start finding out these things, especially when you're researching history or even if whatever war history, when you start finding out these things, like imagine if they, that didn't go like that and it went like this. And the next thing you know, you're going down a rabbit hole of like the whole world that you know right now could be completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Counterfactual history is a big thing. But but on that um, that Japanese unit, yeah, they they would do that. Now they did think about doing it to the states, but they did do that kind of stuff in uh, in China. China got the worst the the worst brunt of that kind of stuff. And like I said, you could argue that well, you know, the most given uh, most common given um, dates for the Second World War in nineteen thirty nine is the start date. But you could probably push that back if you include the Sino Japanese Wars, you know, which begin back. I think that the first one is like 1931 or something like that, or 1937 was when the second one starts off. So you could really like, you know, that's almost, you could argue that that's when the, uh, the, the Second World War starts. But speaking of that, not only did they do that, they also, I think it was like uh, bat bombs, where they wanted to send over a heap of bats with bombs on them. And then there was balloon bombs as well. And they were just, I think they did do the balloon bombs, but yeah, they tried to send over a heap of bats and they would be shot out of the sky or they would just get knackered and fall out of the sky and then just, you know, blow up a heap of stuff. The so. fucking animal ones are the funniest ones in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like the pigeon, pigeon guided bombs. And Dude, like have you seen the fucking animal, the, the kitty one, the surveillance kitty? They no. They spent $20 million oh, yes, yes, on yes. putting a cat with a surveillance thing, and it fucking yeah. died 10 minutes after it was yeah. launched. I like was like, taxi. fucking sure. way, man. There's the, uh, there were the, I think it was during the Second World War, there was the Russian uh, mine dogs, where oh. they would send out these mine, dogs with mines on the back to go attack the enemy tanks, but just because they're dogs and they're friendly and they know these guys, they'd run underneath their own tanks and blow up their own guys. Or the same, I think there was, uh, the states had dolphins with bombs on them or something like that. Our, our NASA program has taught dogs, or not NASA, our uh, Navy program has taught um, dolphins to be able to have like these lasers that on the side of their heads yeah. that can help disarm bombs. Also teaching seals to do deep water rescues. So that's interesting as hell. But like yeah. you hear in Afghanistan or something, they're putting uh, dynamite onto uh, horses and donkeys and trying to slap their ass to get them to run at the enemy. I'm like... Mm -hmm wow like this is some barbaric shit yeah 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 actually there's a there's a, a small battle that's not really well known in ireland uh the battle of bag and bun in 1170 you know, so we're, we're going a good distance back but like that um so basically what's happening is the normans have landed in ireland these invaders have landed in ireland they're holed up in this one little kind of fort and the locals um from waterford and wexford and some vikings they basically show up and they're like, right lads, we don't like you. We're going to kill you all. Uh, their Normans are vastly outnumbered. So they go, right, we're going to do something about this. What are we going to do? And they go to charge out. But in the melee, somehow, as the Normans are char charging out of the town, they're after robbing all of the locals' cattle for food. And, you know, but basically as they're charging out of the town, the cattle manage to get out of this pen that they're in. And they run out in front of the, uh, the Normans, plow into the group of Irish and Viking army, scatter them all to hell, and then the Normans come in, kill off everybody, you know, and, and win the day when they were, you know, so like that, what you were talking about, like, you know, the, that what if, that, oh, you know, what would happen if the cattle stayed in the pen? Yeah, they were all going to die, but because the, got, the cattle got out of that pen, you know, they managed to win the, 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 they win the battle, and all the, they capture, I think, something like 60 leaders, break their legs, and throw them up. 
uh, throw them off cliffs into the sea, you know. Yeah, yeah when we're also talking about uh, Jack, uh, I think Jack Churchfield, the one dude, the 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 one the sword and the bagpipes. Yeah. Um, when after he broke out of his imprisonment or prison camp, he walked like I think it was like twenty two something miles back to the nearest camp he could find immediately without even like for me, I'd be like, I want to fucking eat. I want to lay down for a little bit. I'm tired. I was just in a war camp. He fucking went in, found a sword, put it onto his hip, got his ammo and his guns and started walking right back to the fucking camp. And everyone's like, what are you doing? Where are you going? He said, come with me. We're going to fuck shit up. Like he literally killed all the people that he said he was going to kill as well. And you start hearing accounts like that and people throughout history. I'm like, I would have been more than happy to learn about these folks, the people that had the perseverance, the amount of time and effort and went through legit hell just to be able to, you know, do what they said they were going to do, be able to stand up for what they believed in as well. And I think it's a prime importance, especially in a podcast like yours, that this stuff's out there because this is information I think a lot of people need to know about. Yeah, certainly. I mean, um, that reminded me of another soldier uh, in the Second World War. So basically, have you ever heard of uh, the British Special Forces SAS? I think so. That's the one um, like the Secret Service for uh, the Queen, right? No, no, no. So basically, the, the SAS are essentially the British equivalent of the Navy SEALs. Okay. Um, and so their origins um, are in the Second World War. They're called L Detachment. But basically, like that, one of these guys, um, so in the desert of North Africa, they would you know, drive for a couple of days into the desert, strike at this camp, you know, and then just bail out. But one of these guys, he misses his RV point, his pickup point, and so he ends up walking 200 miles into the desert and like i think he has like a bottle of water with him and like a handful of dates you know and off he goes he didn't have a fucking ipod or anything dude you know how boring of a walk that must have happened to him then he he basically he's he's a couple of miles out gets captured (laughs) has to do it all over again holy shit dude i just imagine trying to do that fucking walk like people talk about the trail of tears i'm like you better have a good ass mixtape loaded up onto your phone or something to be able to walk sure for sure but actually speaking of speaking of uh um ses and and modern forces so this scottish guy david sterling major david sterling um he creates the idea of the ses but it's actually he gets captured really early in the war in north africa uh, basically a year into it or something like that. I think he's captured in 1942. And basically it, the second in command, the next guy who leads it is another Irish guy. And this guy called uh, Blair, his nickname was Paddy, but Blair Main. And uh, he's this like heavyweight boxer, a rugby international lawyer um, who basically joined for the crack. You know, he was just like, here, you know, there's war going. I'm bored of sitting at home. Let's go and do this. And he ends up like being an absolute animal. And he becomes basically the father of all modern special forces training like any of that stuff that you see on you know whatever tv program uh, or, or any movie with the, the the seals in it or or any special forces this guy this irish guy from uh ulster he uh paddy main he's basically the guy who created this and was like no no no, you have to be the cream of your crop all the time and like an hour before an operation if he didn't like the cut of your jib or he thought that you weren't you know up to scratch he was like yeah no bugger off you know back sends back to unit because you just you weren't cutting the mustard now nah, get out and like so he's his like his uh just what he expected of people it was just sky high all the time um but yeah he 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 has some crazy stories like he jumps in on one of these raids he he uh won the first raids lands into this um they sneak into this italian airfield and they plant a heap of bombs he's actually destroyed more planes with his bare hands, sorry, um, yeah, he's destroyed more planes uh, with his own bare hands and, and bombs than any other pilot in the Second World War. <laughs> he would basically just like blow up a heap of them. Like on, on one raid in particular, I think he gets 48 planes, you know, he's just like sticking bombs into the petrol tank or whatever. He runs out of bombs, he jumps up and he smashes out the center console. But basically he runs into this um, building on, on one of these airstrips and uh, he basically like, he's got like 30 or 40 enemy personnel in there and he's just like even gents just blasts them all you know um, so, i mean glorious bastard type stuff man exactly. more like uh, yeah, yeah. i'm here to kick ass and chew bubble gum and i'm all out of bubble gum yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah but basically like that guy paddy main he's yeah the father of modern special forces you know uh, special force training certainly you know it goes to david sterling a lot because he created the idea but 
main he he basically takes it and runs with it and, and makes it into what it is today. Sounds badass to me, man. I really appreciate yeah, yeah. you coming out and doing the podcast, David. I mean, this, oh, yeah, is, thanks very much. this is awesome, dude. I, I really want to give you here a minute at the end to be able to promote your content, dude. Plug your podcast, plug anywhere anybody can find you to make sure that um, I can link it all in the description so people can click there as well. Yeah, cheers. Thanks very much for having me on. It was a bit of crack. Um, but yeah, you'll find me at the Irish. Uh, if you Google the Irish at war, you'll find me on Twitter at Ireland Battles on Instagram at Ireland Battles. My website is theirishatwar.com. Uh, and my podcast you'll find on iTunes, SoundCloud, Acast, and wherever you get it. Uh, and it is The Irish at War. Now, please sign us off with that beautiful accent. Thanks very much. I'm Dave Cummins. Dahi Yochumi Nisanam Dum. Slong of all.